Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Uh, well, that's not right. I'm not hearing you. Hmm. That's oh. strange. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? You're not hearing me at all. Sorry, uh, uh, everyone. Oh, it's coming on here. Can you? Can you hear me can now? You hear me. Can you? Yes, I can. Okay. I can hear you. All right. Sorry, viewers. I'm gonna. Uh, <laughs> we're testing our Zoom right now, so we've actually gone live already. You're already online. Yeah, uh, and uh, usually I have a theme song that's playing, and I talk to the viewers and I play them something before I bring the guests on. But since we're in die straight with the audio, I thought we'd just uh, make sure that everything's fine. Um, so you can hear me, and I can hear you, but I don't see Dawn yet. <laughs> yes, I wonder. Um, you know, I didn't realize that you had sent me. Maybe Don missed it too. I went back and that's how I found it. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I I did look at my emails just to see if maybe you or Don got a little lost. So I did send you another email with the same link. And I sent Don another email as well just a few minutes ago. So hopefully, oh, okay. well, hopefully yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> finds it. Um, <laughs> if not, I guess I could call him. Sure. Uh, shall I call? Uh, let me call him. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'll have to unplug my phone. One second. Sure. Because I usually use the phone as a second camera as well. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me see if that. So let's do that. Uh, viewers, thanks for your patience. I can see um, my usual, my great friends, Gary, thanks for joining us. Joshua LeClaire, nice to see you from Poway, California. And uh, Sam from Sydney, Australia is here as well. Mike Flavin from, um, oh, help, uh, Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, Pat, those are just a few of the viewers that you could probably see on the live chat if uh, you have the live chat displayed. So I'm just reading off the live chat now. I'm going to call Dawn right now. So everyone just okay. hold on to your chairs, please. <laughs> so let's see. Dawn, 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 Dawn. Um, I had his number here. Here we go. Oh, okay. Thanks, Andre. I just saw a, a message from Andre. He says that he's calling Dawn now, so. <laughs> and hi, Kevin. We have Kevin as well in the live chat from Queens. Is this a Kevin that I know or it's another Kevin? Thanks for saying hi in the live chat. I see there are a few of the virtual bodies there. Pat, I call them virtual bodies because, you know, they're, they're not here in physical form. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, well, we'll all be in that situation someday. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, Andre just told me that uh, Don is logging on right now. So let me put my phone back to the... Uh... <clears throat> okay. The marvels of technology. <laughs> I, you know, Zoom meetings are so chancy. <laughs> I mean, they really are. 
God, I'd <laughs> say that the failure rate is about 40%. Uh, yeah, that's uh... maybe, maybe not quite that bad, but bad. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, it's a tricky one. My setup's also a little tricky because I, I don't know if you're, I'm sure you're familiar with main stage. I'm running main stage as well because I usually play something for my viewing audience members. Um, so I'm tying that into my streaming software uh -huh. as well as Zoom or Skype. Um, I think I probably mentioned this the last time we spoke. So I always have to make sure that everything's running just right just in case something just decides to go amiss. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. Uh, I yeah. see someone else in the live chat. Hi, Doug. Doug Lu. Uh, I can never say your last name. Luolin. Did I get that right, Doug? Doug's from R Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. <laughs> and I know it's Raleigh because I have friends living in Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> see. That's right next to where I played um, the last Smoke Fest. Oh yeah, uh, which year was that? Yeah, they moved the fest two, to Raleigh, two. didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Two, well, right outside. Two thousand nineteen. That was that oh, was the last Smoke Fest. Two thousand nineteen. Yeah, I was there, but I played on the fringe at the fringe, or I played played as part of the fringe. <laughs> Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, the place. I love this place. It's called Arcana. It's in Raleigh as well. Um, oh, okay. In t I, I did play at uh, Moltfest proper in 2007, but that was uh, at BB King uh, Times Square. Oh, here we, uh, here we uh, are. Here's Stella. Is, I don't see Don yet. Yes, he, I just admitted him. He'll be here in one second. He will be... Okay. Oh, here we are. And there's me and you. There's a black box. Oh, uh, Don, <laughs> you need to turn your video on. Oh, Don. <laughs> uh, ah! There we go. There we go. Hey, Don. He's, his audio is audio. Yeah, his audio's connecting right now. So in a few secs, I think. I love that he's got both his pair of glasses on his face, one on the head and one kind of askew on his nose. <laughs> I don't know if that works. <laughs> Hey, Don, can you hear me? Connecting. St still connecting. Do that. Ah! There we are. There okay. we are. Now. We hear you loud hey, and clear. I'm just going to check Hi. in with the viewing audience. Everyone out there, can you hear all three of us clearly? Someone please give me a, a yay or a nay so I can... Uh, be absolutely sure there are no other technical issues I have to deal with before we carry on. Okay. There you are, Don. Hi. All How right. Yeah, I thought it was an hour from now, so I'm very sorry for that. It's a mix up in my head. Don't be sorry. <laughs> I tell you what. Hey, Don. Yeah. Sorry, Don. Don, send me an email after the, the Zoom call so I'll have your email address. Oh, I will. Okay, great. Do that. Pat, if he yeah. does not, there have been several group emails that I've gone your way. So just look for oh, the okay. group emails and you see if I addressed you and Don and Andre, those are the group emails. Oh, so sure, you'll be course. able to find okay. his email address there yes. as well, just in yes. case he forgets. But but you know, I'm an old guy. My my job is to be incompetent with technology. I'm just trying to keep up, you know. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <clears throat> it things change every second and every minute. It is not funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have now uh, in in my Ableton Live live gig. I've uh, I've got um, probably 400 software apps 
Oh. I just got a, 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 a an Ableton Live and, uh, and also, what do you call that thing? The uh, push? push. Oh, yeah, push. I didn't, I had push and I didn't like it. Yeah, I don't people, like it either. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's, I'm going to offer to sell it to you, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Don. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's what indeed. friends are for, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I think we've conducted our last synthesizer sale, Don. But thank you very much. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to do the formal introduction now, uh, which is a, a little spiel I always do for uh, my audience members, and I'll do it in this group because we're all present. So I won't change scenes and all that like I usually do. But I shall say it's so nice to see everyone again virtually to my viewing audience. You're on Music and Chat with Shelly Ong, and it's a good evening from me to you in Nashville, Tennessee, where I am right now. It's a cold, wintry evening, brr. Wow. <laughs> um, and you guys already know the, the routine. You all have said hi in the live chat, but I usually request that you say hi. Give us your name and tell us where you're tuning in from so that we can have a conversation with you as well. And don't be backward and coming forward. If you have any- Hi there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and if you have any questions, we're here to answer your questions. Put them in the live chat over there with everyone else, and I will attend to them as the stream moves along. And I usually do this when I say the stream moves along. And uh, you guys already know that there's usually about a 30 second to a minute, maybe a minute and a half lag. So uh, Pat, Don, and I might be talking about uh, the rain right now, for example, but you will only hear about it. <laughs> A bit later. <laughs> okay. So don't get too impatient. Whoops, something just fell. Uh, but which is to say, put in your questions or your comments in the live chat uh, the moment you think of them so that we can receive them a little later and we can get them to you also a little later, but at least you get them. <laughs> I also want to say um, Happy Chinese New Year or Lunar New Year to everybody. See, I've got my red color on. Red's supposed to be an auspicious wow. color. Today is Chinese New Year's? Is that the, it's today? Uh, Chinese New Year, just like Christmas, runs over several days. Oh, and it's 14 mm -hmm. days. But usually the that? first three days are the important days. So today is the second day of Chinese New Year. Oh. Oh, cool. And what is it becoming a year of? Ox. Fox. Okay, I like it. Yeah, uh, I I I don't <laughs> quite remember what the year of the ox is supposed to bring, but I guess it's it should have similar characteristics to the animal. <laughs> Who knows? Well, I don't know. It works pretty well for Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we we got into this. <laughs> Almost five minutes without mentioning his name. Almost a record. Yeah, we better be yeah. careful because it's a live stream and YouTube is qu YouTube is quite severe about its punishment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it, it, they do detect any um, any uh, attempts at being naughty, so to speak, quite immediately, and they could shut you down. So we don't want to be shut down today. <laughs> no, 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 that wouldn't be good. <laughs> uh, we have another friend of ours, Mike Flavin, who says Happy New Year. We got quite a few people today. Thanks so much, guys. Um, but I want to wish everyone uh, prosperity and good health. I think okay, I guess you could you. look at the word prosperity in in many ways, you know, it could be wealth, it could be health, it could be uh, whatever you want it to be, but I wish it upon you all. So there you go. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. I would you like me to play the piece I have prepared for everyone today? Or shall we just move on? It's up to you all. It's up to you, my dear. Okay. No, you're running the show. Okay, um, I'll wait for a second for the viewing audience. You guys, if you want me to play something, tell me 
in the next few seconds if not i shall carry on but uh while i wait uh i believe it's 18 past 7 central time pet and dawn are on the west coast so you are 5 18 p.m i believe mm -hmm. and That's uh it. It's 18 past 9 a.m. in Singapore the next day. <laughs> and it's uh -huh. 12 noon in Australia the next day. Oh. <laughs> so, and I usually say uh, reveal the times to my friends because these are the folks who gather from these three countries, these three cities. Okay, so I've got a, uh, I've got, yes, please play something for, from the viewing audience, so I shall. Um, Don and Pat, you stay, sit tight where you are on Zoom. I'm going to change scenes uh, because that's the only way I'm able to broadcast what I'm playing. You can watch and hear me if you have a separate device to monitor the live stream. If not, don't worry because you can always see the replay after. It will be archived on my YouTube channel. You can always watch it later. So I'm going to request that you kind of keep the chatter on the low end so that I don't hear you too much <laughs> for about three minutes. I'm going to play something that lasts three minutes. Uh, okay, guys, I'm going to play a couple of movements from this concerto I've been threatening to record. Uh, I spent a few years, as you guys know, just putting some movements together and I never did record it be just because. I didn't have a good reason to record it, but I think this year might be the year to record it. So uh, the two movements are called Isabel 1 and 2. They're from different parts of the concerto, but I've uh, put them together so that I can play them as though they were one piece. And you'll realize why, because it's got a similar motif that runs through the two short movements. So. Here we go. I'm going to change scenes now, Pat, Don. Uh, everyone, you should be able to see me and my theremin. Uh, so here we go. I'm just going to check that my theremin's are still calibrated first. <laughs> Okay, you guys, I can hear you still. <laughs> Just for three minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, okay, here guys, it's uh, Isabel 1 and 2, okay? <laughs>
So that was uh, Isabel 1 and 2. And Don is back in his chair. <laughs> so it's usually at this point where I introduce the, the guests, but since you're here already, let me just get a few things sorted out because I need to use them. So one second. Scene, 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 scene. No, not this. No, not that. No, not this. Yes, found it. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to start with a little chat with uh, the movie Apocalypse now, of course. Um, so I'll just give a little backstory for the viewing audience. Um, so Francis uh, Ford Coppola wrote, produced, and directed uh, the movie 42 years ago in 1979. Set during the Vietnam War, it took 16 months to complete and start Marlon Brando, Martin Sheen, Lawrence Fishburne, Harrison Ford, Robert Duvall, and several others. It had a spectacular electronic score, and we have Don Preston and Pat Gleason to tell us a bit about it, especially their parts in it. So everyone, please give them a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, I did find a documentary called Apocalypse Now Sound Design, and I took a few snippets of it uh, and put them into a little video clip to play for you all. So let's look at that first, shall we? Here we go. Wanted to make the sound and music more enmeshed. So the initial discussion I had with Francis, which kind of set the ground work, was that he wanted the sound to be faithful to the sound of that particular war, which had a unique sound both technically because of the kind of weapons that were used and also because of what Francis called the psychedelic dimension. Francis asked me who the heavyweights in the world of electronic music were. So I came up with a list of five names, submitted them to Francis. He, he actually ended up hiring all five of these individuals. Which... And according to the end credits of the movie, thanks to our friend Gary who took a screenshot of it, the five individuals mentioned in the documentary included uh, Richard Beggs, Bernie Krause, Don Preston, our esteemed guest today, Shirley Walker, Niall Steiner, and also the other esteemed guest, Patrick Gleason. The a film was the first to have a stereo surround sound. And I happened to find the soundtrack cue list, uh, and I took uh, got some pictures and 20-second audio clips of two of the cues, uh, and I'll play them. Uh, but first, uh, a few questions for Don and Pat. So those five names I mentioned to, uh, you know, two of you, but uh, were you acquainted with the rest of the synthesists uh, on the job? And were you familiar with their methods? Or did you just meet them for the first time there? Don, do you want to go first? Uh well, I want to preface this with uh, a little bit of the history, and that is before we did the film score, uh, Peter Shire was hired to do the film score, and he uh, worked in Los Angeles at a studio that once had been uh, Paul Beaver's studio, uh, of Beaver and Krauss, you know, the same Beaver. Anyhow, <laughs> and it's kind of funny. Uh, so in the middle of doing the film score, they actually did the whole score. Peter and Talia Shire got a divorce. Now they're Italian, right? So what happened was that Coppola went to Peter and he said, you're off the score, you're fired, <laughs> whatever. I'm not sure what he said, but uh, anyhow, that score didn't become part of the film. Yeah. So uh, then, then after that, uh, David Rubinson called me and said, uh, 
hi, uh, uh, we want to rent your synthesizer. I, apparently, Pat, you see, you told him that I had your ex yeah. synthesizer. I didn't and tell him we, to rent the synthesizer. <laughs> Is that what he said to you? Well, right yeah, here. he said we wanted to, he wanted to rent it. And then he asked me, what's your name again? And I said, Don Preston. You mean the Don Preston, if you will. Uh, and I said, yeah, I was in the mothers and all this stuff. Uh, and uh, so he said, why should we rent your synthesizer? We can just hire you instead of paying some guy up here that we don't know. So uh, I agreed to that. And uh, and then I was on my way up to uh, San Francisco and uh, getting installed in David Rubinson's uh, studio. Uh, bless his soul, he passed away uh, since then, as many what? people in the room have. Did Rubinson? Yeah, sure. About uh, maybe eight years ago, something like no, that. No, 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 no. Oh. I've, I've been in co correspondence with him. Oh, dear. Well, Can someone in the viewing audience told. check? That's all I know. Okay, well, anyway. Uh, so This is why we have historians. Yeah, uh, someone <laughs> in the viewing audience check. But for those who are not familiar with David Rubins, Rubinson, he was uh, the owner of the, the Automat, right? The other One of three uh, recording studios involved in the soundtrack, yeah. if I'm not yeah. wrong. And the other one of the three also being Pat, your studio, different for... If I'm not wrong, which, by the way, uh, Herbie Hancock recorded there a lot. Right. Uh, he he actually was sitting in the studio one day when I was I got there early and I was just playing the piano and and then huh. uh, according to Dave Rubinson, he, Herbie said, "Who is that guy?" <laughs> so anyhow, I don't know what that was about, but anyhow. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. So uh, then, then I proceeded working on the film with, uh, mm, you can't get that name. Which? Niles Steiner. Huh? Niles, Niles Steiner. Niles Steiner, right. Yeah. yeah. The inventor of the EV and the EW. And <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> For those so of you unfamiliar, the EV and the EW are... Uh, MIDI, uh, they were MIDI ball, right? They're MIDI controllers. Uh, one yeah. mm -hmm. has valves, which yeah. is played like a trumpet, and the other is like a wind controller, like the later version of the Yamaha wind controller style, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. just before, I mean, that's about all for me, but uh, I will say that the way that they did the film, I mean, you, get, you know, you got the the music sunk up to the the actual film was totally unique and uh very back now you got to realize this is back in the time when you had that big giant book that had all the timings of the metronome markings and the you know god that was a horrible thing uh, yeah, I'm curious as what, to your what? spotting session and how that went, but I do know that uh, Apocalypse Now was probably the first announced movie released in stereo surround format, mm -hmm. as far as I, I, I read. Uh, and uh, Gary Yelton, you guys probably know him, he says, according to Willypedia, is that Willypedia or Wikipedia? I don't know. I didn't know there was a Willypedia, but Rubinson is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> he is definitely still alive. I I just uh, sent him an email last week. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> well, that's yeah. good. Really uh, hmm? he's, he's, he's living in the south of France. Oh. With his, oh. Be with his beautiful Jamaican wife nice. and two children who are now, I would think, pretty close to growing and Ooh, has his own farm. It. He's got an organic wow. farm. So David's living the good life. Wow. Oh. Very nice. Yeah. How about you, okay. Pat? Were you familiar with the other synthesis, Niall, Shirley, and Bernie, when you first arrived? Well, well yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that's an interesting story. Um, my perspective on, on Apocalypse Now and my participation in it um, 
isn't entirely favorable. Mm. And part of the problem was that Francis in, in all, I, you know, it's his movie, he can do what he wants. He had this dinner for all of us. And at the dinner, he announced what everybody, who everybody was, although we all knew one another, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. Okay. But what he said at the dinner was, you know, this guy is this person and Shirley is this person and so forth. And then he came to me and he said, and Pat is the master synthesis. I want to ask you about that, but you go on first. Okay. Well, <laughs> so <clears throat> here you have five synthesis in mid-career, all successful. And suddenly from nowhere, they're told that, Oh no, no, this is this is this is the, the lead guy. This is the boss. It didn't go down very well. Oh. Uh, I think Don pretty much just ignored it. <laughs> Niall. <laughs> Niall. I, I didn't care. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I kind of wish I hadn't been selected because what else happened was this. Bernie Krause had used my studio for several years making the Beaver and Krause albums. And I was his engineer. Oh. And I was just beginning music at that time. And so they were the big guys and I was the little guy. And now suddenly, Francis Coppola is saying, no, 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 that's all changed. Now Pat's in charge of you. And Bernie hated it. And, yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> so the, the job that I was tasked with was I was supposed to go around to everybody else's studio mm -hmm. and basically listen to what they were doing and make any changes I thought needed to be made and so forth. Well, I only did that with one cue and that was a cue of Bernie's and it, it needed help. And Bernie just, he was so upset about that, that after I left the studio, he erased what I had done. <laughs> Okay, now, now the story the story gets even thicker because what happened was Shirley Walker and Bernie were working together. Shirley, rest in peace, was not a big Bernie fan. She thought Bernie was insufficiently attentive to the music or it was, wasn't sufficiently motivated or whatever it was. So then she went to Doug Claiborne, who was the production manager, he was Francis' production manager, and demanded that Bernie be fired. Oh boy. Yeah, okay. So I, the first I heard of it was, I, I got the list of the next cues and Bernie's name is not on any of the cues. So I phoned Doug and I said, you know, there's a mistake in, in the printout because Bernie's name, he said, well, Bernie's no longer working on the project. I said, oh my God. I didn't I said, know this. Well, they, no, nobody did. This is the first time I've ever told anybody about it. Oh my this. God. So <clears throat> I said, wait a minute, Doug. Francis put me in charge of the music. And you're telling me that, that Bernie's been fired without even noticing me, without asking me what I thought. And Doug was a very nice guy. And he said, you know, I'm really sorry about that. You know, it was kind of water under the bridge or whatever. I said, no, no. I said, either Bernie is back on the job or I quit. Wow. And so Doug laughed and he said, yeah, I said, yeah, yeah. I said, no, 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 I, I'm not joking. I mean it. He said, you're not serious. I said, I am serious. If I'm either in charge of this project or I'm not. So, so Bernie got put back on the job. And then it was after that, I went down and I listened to this queue of Bernie's and, and I, I made some changes in the queue and Bernie erased everything. I, I never told him, I don't think he knows to this day that I got his job back for him. In fact, my, my ex-wife said to me, she said, after I had the phone call, she said, now you've really done it. I said, what do you mean? She said, Bernie will never forgive you for this. I said, for what? She said, for saving his job. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, 
so you know the, from from my perspective it was a very troubled kind of work situation and uh, i i have read bernie saying that basically he quit the music business because of his experience on apocalypse oh my god yeah, yeah. yeah. so, so it was the same thing happened with me no, no. <laughs> surely no. tried to get me off the oh, 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 oh she did <laughs> and you said if you get him off i'm quitting yeah. yeah, that's what I remember. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess I must have said that to you about you too. <laughs> but the, I remember it with Bernie because I never th took the thing very seriously. About it. they never got far enough with you to, to do any harm. But um, but with Bernie, they had, they actually had, you know dropped the guy. So it was a strange situation. Um, and I'm I will say when I went. Uh, and he heard the, the, the premiere performance, I was so upset <laughs> that I didn't, I didn't, huh, you too? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't li listen to the music or watch the film for two years, Wow. you know. I well, think... I mean, there was no music. I mean, it was like so below uh, everything else <laughs> that you could barely hear it. Well, well, yeah, this is what happened. What it's what happens when you have the person who is doing the mixing of the yeah. film. He was also the sound designer. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. and he's an immensely sound design. Yeah, he's an immensely talented guy. In fact, he was the guy who invented the name sound design. Yeah. Oh, is that so? Yeah. You, are you talk, referring to Walter Murch? Yeah. yeah, Walter. Yeah. He he yeah. he came up with the name sound design. Yeah. Yep, that was Tim. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, and and he wanted to do. He, well, at a certain point, he proposed to me that we just get rid of of everything in a particular queue. That um, Fra uh, Francis' dad had written, and just start over. Oh and, and I said, no, no, no. <laughs> that, and, and then he said, well, he said. Then, then that cue's not. If that flute is in that cue, it's not going into the film. Did he and have he, the? He tried to get me to, did he have the power to do that, so to speak? Well, he was Francis' very close friend. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 story is that when Francis left US, USC or UCLA, I can't remember. I guess USC mm -hmm. Film School, and drove his equipment up to San Francisco. Uh -huh. Walter Murch was in the truck. I mean, that's how old that friendship was. So wow. it was a very close and powerful friendship. And I think that that ultimately Walter Murch's influence on the film was, was incredibly good. But the, the score, in my view, was doomed from the start. You know, because the guy that's writing the music for the score, does, it's a synthesized score and he doesn't know how to do a mini mode patch. He knows nothing at all about synthesis. He's younger than Don and I are now, but he was, in our view, an old guy and, and not hip to contemporary technology. So, so was it Francis it was kind of who did situation. the writing or was it Carmine, uh, Francis's father, who did the writing? Or am I have well, I Carmine, been, Carmine did the writing? Car Car Carmine was the composer. Ah. And, and the way the music would come to Don and me mm. was we would get <clears throat> the film on a U-Matic, the, really? the Q, on a U-Matic, which is a, a video recorder yeah. for young folks. For those, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, and on that would be Shirley's piano rendition oh. of what Carmine had written. Yeah. And this is why her, like Shirley was even brought on to the project. Um, I mean, she had more ambitions, which is probably why she tried to get rid of you and, and particularly Bernie. But, but wow. she was brought onto the project originally simply as the pianist who would realize Carmine's uh, music was on she, piano. Was she a synthesis? A was she a synthesis at all? No, no. But no. she's, a, no, but, she's but, credited as a synthesis in the end yes, credits. And, well, so is Walter. So so is Richard Bennett. Yeah, so I noticed. Well, there's there, there's not the, to my knowledge. You never know, but mm. to my knowledge, there's not a single note 
that, in that score that Richard played. I never saw it. I never heard it. Hmm. Or Shirley. Who, you know. hmm? I don't remember her playing anything, at least on the stuff I Well, had. she's, you know, she she was a much better, I won't lie, she was, she was, she was, she was a more a ambitious, huh? She was, she was a great, great sight reader. reader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she was the pianist for the Oakland Symphony. Right. I read somewhere that she got to play Niles' uh, other instrument. Uh, hold on, let me see if I can find it. The oh, synth system she played on one of the cues or two of the cues. It seems. <clears throat> no, she sang. She sang. She sang. She was a singer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that the best cue in the film, which was Bernie's cue, by the way. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Don, but I, don't, I think you and I would probably agree that the, the cue where the helicopters are flying over. The yeah. very first yeah. one? Yeah. <coughs> no, it's the one. The, the, hmm? Wasn't that da 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 and that, that was that was to me the best cue in the film, wow. and she 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 added voice to it. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, and it worked. It was good. It was a good cue. Um, but to me, the, the project was a strange project. In fact, I have since heard the cues, the, the score that was done in L.A. Have you done? Yeah, I mean, I, I think. After all was said and done and everything, and they finally got the the, the volume levels correct, uh, it wasn't too bad. It was mm -hmm. Not too bad. But 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 the, but the earlier score that um, what is his name? Uh, Italia's uh, husband. Peter Shire. Yeah, I think it's and a, David Shire. David Shire. Uh, David Shire. Thank you yeah. very much. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, I couldn't because it all from it. I, I heard that score, and I, I, I think, frankly, it's a better score. Yeah, it seems well, that's been it. released. I haven't heard, heard it yet, but um, I don't know if you guys know that there was a Redux release in 2001, a, you know, uh, where uh, Francis added extra footage because, you know, he thought that this was, this was a chance to, to do it right. But then... Yeah. Um, Two years ago, they released a final cut version where he trimmed off <laughs> footage because uh, he thought now he thinks he's got it right. So those of uh, you who, who are Apocalypse Now fans, see if you can find the <laughs> final cut version that was uh, released, first released in April 2019 at the Tribeca Film Festival. And later in the year, I think in the USA, I haven't seen it yet, but this is what I read. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't well, like, I, I, I watched that and I didn't like it at all. <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, um, do, you, do you guys know Bruce Connor, the artist Bruce Connor? Uh, oh, I think well, I do. Yeah, anyway, um, one one of the great beat. Uh, painters and filmmakers and so forth. Mm -hmm. And he said about Francis, which I think is absolutely true. He said, Francis, the nature of his creativity is that he puts all the building blocks up in place like a kid with a, with a block set and then for the pleasure of knocking it back down again. Wow. <laughs> and, I, I and, love Bruce's films. Yeah, they're great. Oh, oh yeah. Well, you know, I, I scored four of them. Wow. Yeah. Great. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful artist. But anyway, so you know, there's that's kind of typical of Francis. Nothing is ever in final state. It's subject to improvement and revision. He's one of those where, uh, if he were recording an album, it never finishes. It never gets finished. <laughs> is that that's right? true of most people. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. It is true. Yeah. So that's why they come and take it away. I'm never done, but I I, I have to release it anyhow. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, Pat, were you then the synthesis wrangler or was it Shirley? 
you want to synthesize? Well, you know, Shirley, Shirley was ambitious about her job in a way that I was not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I had, a, at that point, a, a very, that was the busiest decade I, I think I ever had. Oh. I was working as a studio musician. I was working as a film composer. Mm -hmm. um, I was working as a producer. Mm -hmm. So, and also I owned a studio, which although I had a studio manager, I still have to pay some attention to that. Mm. I was blessed and a wonderful studio manager, but still. So I had a lot on my plate. In fact, Francis asked me to start a, a film, a, a synthesis studio devoted to film. And I knew if I did that in one sense, it would be, you know, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I thought I'm gonna, that would mean ending everything I'm doing now. And right. becoming a satellite to Francis. Uh, I, Francis is a wonderful person, and very creative, but that was not what I wanted to do. Mm. So I told him no. Mm. <laughs> so regarding the cues, did they arrive? Were they delivered to you directly from when Carmine had finished the monumentic tape, or, or maybe via? Uh, Shirley, or did it go to someone else first? So you got the first scoop, so or to speak. a runner, a runner would come. A runner would come to Don's studio and to my studio and drop off the tape. I see. That was how that worked. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So there was. Can I assume, therefore, there was kind of one person at each of the three studios, kind of minding the business, so to speak. Of making no, things happen. No, there was just there was just. I'm, I'm assuming Don, yours was like mine. I mean, I was on my own. Francis used to come by. Mm, I see. He, 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 some way or other, he liked different fur, and he would go upstairs and take a nap oh. in my apartment, and then come back down. Um, but uh, other than that, I was on my own. And I'm, I'm sure Don, it was the same for you, right? Uh, well, I was with uh, what's his name. Steiner. Nile? Oh, you and you and Nile were together. Oh, oh I, 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 I yeah, we, that. we worked on all the, all the cues together, you know, most of the Oh, time. that must have been fun. So it was. It was good. He's a very funny guy. <laughs> how <laughs> then? Strange. Sorry. How then did you decide what kind of sounds you wanted to create from the piano rendition of the score, so to speak? Because from what I understand, well, we, we Shirley did a piano version. So no, no, is that we had we had the score of the film. Oh, all right. That she was reading a score for an orchestra. Okay. And she was Got reading it. that score when we, in order to have us sunk up to the movie. Okay. She was, in other words, uh, Carmen would conduct her while she was watching and they were both watching the film and, and she was like reading music got it so yeah that was earlier on I, I was trying to say how that was one of the most unique ways of linking the music to the film that i've ever experienced did you like it oh i thought it was incredible it was mm -hmm. so easy so easy mm -hmm. i was different i was, I was rebellious about it I, because i had differences of, of opinion about pacing and so forth oh, oh. But, i mean i did timing hmm? yeah yeah, timing yeah. Or... I, oh okay i i felt well, uh that in general the tempo of the film was of the music was in it was too too rapid in terms of, of melodic progression that the melodies were coming up too quickly that was rather old-fashioned in that sense uh -huh. but, but i but didn't have that problem yeah yeah uh, that was just my a lot of my stuff was slow mm. uh, you know the dossier stuff and uh oh okay uh even clean's death which was uh, the one cue that got uh, I stolen from me. <laughs> Is that the one that you sent me? Yeah. Okay. You know, like Good. Francis How was would come in the studio and he said, "Okay, Don, I want you to make this really big." Oh yeah. Really big. 
just make it big, Don. And so uh, when we finally got the, the volume straightened out and played it, I, I said, where's my music? And he said, Don, it was too big. So he said, it sounded like the end of the movie. It couldn't be used. No, your fault. Yeah. Well, yeah. since we got, uh, we've mentioned the cues, uh, let's look at a couple of the cues, including the one that was unused, uh, that Don, you sent me. Um, from what I discovered online, uh, one of the first cues where Don and Carmen and Niall did some work on was the dossier cue. And I did take a short 20 second clip uh, from the okay. original soundtrack. That way you can hear it more clearly because I do agree with you when I tried to catch clips from the movie itself, uh, the music slash sound was mixed so low down I couldn't hear really much of it at all, which is uh, quite sad really <laughs> considering all the work that went into it and how it was uh, promoted as you know the first movie with an all electronic score and here the the yeah. wizards who put the <laughs> score together and but I can't hear it. <laughs> yeah. Incidentally, uh, uh, Carmen played on, on several of those dossier cues. Okay. And I have to say that when he got that, when he played that part, I, I was I almost fell on the floor. The sound, the sound of that flute was so rich and so mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah, uh, and and also perfect reading, of course. And mm -hmm. so that was a real thrill for me to have him play on that. Okay, uh, let me play you the twenty-second clip, and I've got uh, I did th uh, three screen grabs from that footage as well, which I will display as I play the cue. Uh, for Pat and Dawn, unless you have a separate device seeing a live stream, you won't actually see this. Uh, but okay. again, there's I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah, so you know what it's all about. So here we go, everyone. Here is the uh, clip. So that was that, including the three screen grabs. Um, is uh, do you recall, Don, what you used for that cue? Any particular processes? Which cue was it, dear? I, I I don't have that. Oh, I I couldn't hear it. I'm sorry. Do you recall what processes you used for that cue? Synthesis, of course. I'm talking about. Uh, what equipment you used or what processes you used for the benefit of our viewing audience. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I couldn't hear the clip. Oh, yeah. Uh, you wouldn't have been able to. You'll have to probably see it in the replay. <laughs> but it's precisely okay. what you described. Carm Carmine, sorry, I almost called him Carmile. I don't know why. Carmine. Okay. Uh, play there flute. were three black ladies that came in and sang with that. Oh. And uh, they were quite amazing. And uh, and also, uh, I used the modular synths. And uh, I had a couple Prophet Fives. Oh. That uh, they kept burning out on me. You know, they were, it's before they fixed the heat problem inside of those things. Um, other than that, and then of course Niall played trumpet parts. He could play uh, strings with that EVI and um, great instrument, by the way. I I bought one from him uh, oh. during that kind of time, and I used it a lot on stuff. I even used it on the <laughs> the uh, score to uh, Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Oh, which had a trumpet in it, you know, da da da. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> so that's that's about all I could remember. I mean, that's what is that? 
50 years ago or something. Yep. Four, yeah, yeah, 40 something years ago. How was it like yeah. working with Niall? Was that uh, easy peasy? <laughs> oh, he was great. He was lovely. Uh, I'm just looking. Oh, well, I can't do that. <laughs> He used to, you know, like do weird things like, uh, you see these cans I have in my hand and he'd rub them on his leg or something like that. Now they're magnetized. And then so he'd take the cans and, and go like this. <laughs> or like, he said, now I'm going to turn it around so the polarity is the same. And, and then go like that. <laughs> Anyhow, that was Niall. Yeah. He, he'd do all. The other thing about Niall. He could walk up a railing on a stairway on his hands. Wow. Ooh. I never saw anything like that. Whoa, he, he was ahead any, of his time. Anything you can do with walking with your feet, he could do with his hands. Wow. It's quite amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. He was a strange guy. I mean, you know, yeah. we're, you're, you've described him as, as he is, and he's a strange guy. Yeah. I liked him. I liked him. Very creative. Yeah. yeah. And he was easy to work with too, which is also a good thing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you did the tracking session, did you all play together, you and Niall mm -hmm. and uh, Carmine, or did you do track separately? I did my tracks separately, mm. of course. <laughs> I hate to hear what it sounded like if I did them together. <laughs> I was <laughs> but, just curious. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do. You had two profit fives. I mean, you know, come on. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Of course, I I would do one cue at a time, uh, not necessarily in order, uh, but uh, you know, we we would get a cue in the form of a, a score for an orchestra. Got it. Although I don't. Do you remember if they were transposed or they weren't transposed? I think they were all transposed. No, they weren't transposed, were they? I mean, they were all in, in C. They are all in C, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. like yeah no, they didn't, they didn't trust us to, to, to right, do right. transpositions. <laughs> what key, yeah. what key was, were your parts in then? Different keys? Flat keys? Sharp no, keys? well, <laughs> I don't know, actually. I don't remember. Uh, I think if they were in some other key, all the parts would be in that key. But uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't remember if they, they were in different keys. I'm trying to understand I'm what you just not. said. So you're saying you were given all the cues in the key of C, and then later well, no, they no. were? No, no, they were in different keys. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, but I'm, what we were saying, I'm sorry, we, we were not speaking very, I was not speaking very precisely. What I was saying is that, that the that, for example, B flat instruments would oh. appear on our score page in C rather than in B flat. Got it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it, everything was in C in that sense. Got yeah. it. Got and it. I'm sure Don doesn't remember what key the, these cues were in because I surely don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering because there was mention of trust there, and I thought, is this trust of your musicianship or something else? So I, that's why I asked. I wasn't. Oh. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't quite get what it was all oh, about. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that don't. Be. Don't be. That's why. I, that's why I'm here to ask the questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So. And uh, I do have a cue uh, that. Pat supposedly worked on it's Q number eight, the scene at Dolang, the Dolang Bridge. Oh, Dolang Bridge, oh, it's insufferably long. The thing goes on for how many minutes? 11 minutes or something? I, I You're only not play got, all of it, are you? No, no, I can, I can only play 20 seconds of it. Good. Because, uh, <laughs> and again, I. I did, That'll be plenty. Okay, and I did take a three screen grabs again for the benefit of the viewing audience uh, to whet their appetites in case they want to go watch the film. <laughs> I have the not. The film is a great film. Yeah, I have not yet. I will catch it eventually. It was quite, quite, it took some nerves of steel to sit through the clips themselves. Uh, and I'm glad I had some nerves of steel because, you know, it's a little, it can be a little. Uh, unnerving at times because you know uh, due to the content and the way it was shot really vividly and it, 
you know, it was a great job done by Francis Ford Coppola, of course. Um, all right, so here's the uh, 20 seconds plus the three screen grabs of the Dolang Bridge. There you go. So, uh, Pat, do you remember this cue? <laughs> uh, I try not to remember. <laughs> 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 I, you know, I'm very critical. That's just my nature. And a lot of the music I've done that I've written, I don't like now either. Uh, thank God some of it I do. <laughs> But I, Apocalypse Now was not one of my favorite films mm. to, to work on. I see. It just wasn't. I mean, it was an important film for my career. I, 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 I surely admit that. But mm. as I've said, artistically, there were just too many problems. Mm. Yeah. Do you recall your favorite process that you reached for, you know, due to all these issues that you had and there was an emotional uh, investment or not in the project, did you have some uh, methods that you just naturally do anyway just to get the job done? Well, every cue is different. Every piece of music is different. You start in a different place. so. Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, a set way I, I always work, but um, mm. I think for me, the most important thing is to establish some kind of, of not central in the sense of most important, but, but to establish a synthesis sound mm. that somehow represents this part of the film. Mm. And... Um, that that too was difficult to accomplish on on Apocalypse because when Carmine would come by and, and listen, but if he couldn't hear parts of his melody, he would insist that they be made more prominent. And uh, again, you know, on the other side of the question was Walter Murch, who didn't like the sc the score to begin with. Um, and did not want a lot of Carmine's melodies in the music. Wow. It was a fun, it was a strange, strange project. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And then, and then another funny thing for me was that I shared my studio, not at the same time, but for half a day, Mickey Hart would come in from Grateful Dead and do drum parts for Apocalypse. You know, that, yeah. that, you know that was, that didn't pay any of those guys that he had working with him. He didn't pay them. Never no. paid anyone. Well, that's a very Mickey-esque situation, is it not? <laughs> you know, so Mickey was supposed to work 10 hours, and I was supposed to work 10 hours, and then there would be two hours for maintenance. I mean, it was a big analog studio, and analog studios took a lot of maintenance to keep, you know, everything running as it should. Yeah. So Mickey would, would always keep going. And, and then they, they would even do stuff like holding the studio door shut so that the studio manager couldn't open it and tell them that, you know, it's time to quit. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. I could usually get him out in time for, to do a little maintenance, but he would he would generally, you know, add on another hour or if he was having a bad day, two hours. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't know that Mickey, Mickey never paid the other guys. Was Greg Rico one of them? Sorry. Was Greg Arico one of the guys? I don't know. I know uh, that the the head of the um, music department in, in the Cal Arts uh, was one of the guys. <laughs> John, can't remember his name either. Not Hut Alpin, hmm. was it? <laughs> yeah. At Cal yeah, Arts. So. Oh, I, I wanted to say yeah. that when I was working on the film, 
I, I could not really get, you know, maybe it's just me, but I'm sure it is. Uh, I couldn't get the importance of what I was doing. Uh, when I, usually when I work on something, I throw myself into the project mm -hmm. and I don't, don't really, you know, uh, all the, that other stuff I figure out later. Which I did, you know, and and mm -hmm. I said, "Oh my God, I worked on this," mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. like that. But, but the uh, process wasn't necessarily the best in the world, was it? Yeah, yeah right. And especially when you're you're doing a cue where somebody's head falls on the ground and <laughs> <laughs> that one. <laughs> I watched that over like fifty times in order to do this yeah. cue. Yeah. That was the chef's head, wasn't it? I, I caught that one. It was, I think. Yeah. Chef's head. Yeah, according to some some uh, someone's notes, somewhere it seems that you used the your moog modular and a mini moog through a moog string filter for that scene. I don't know if you recall what you did <laughs> for that scene. The chef's head. The head. The head that was thrown down on Willard's lap by a uh, colonel, was it colonel? Colonel Kurtz. Colonel Kurtz. He actually Kurtz. threw the head on Willard's lap. Mm -hmm. I, wa I had to watch that several times. <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah, I mean, Don and I had to watch it several hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, overall, as as you said, Don. I mean, in retrospect, yeah, this was an important part of of our careers at the yeah. time, uh, and particularly when I, I finally quit doing it. But you recall early on, I would come by the studio and listen to what you guys were doing, and I just quit that because, you know, the idea of my being in charge of everyone. It's, it's, you guys didn't ask for it, and I didn't really want it either. <laughs> I guess someone had to be in charge. <laughs> huh? That was my favorite cue. Sorry? Don? The dual bridge. Don, you hmm? said what was your favorite? That was my favorite cue. Oh, the chef's head? Mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know the premise behind the movie, it's somewhat like this. Uh, um, a crew of five on a boat going up River Nung in Vietnam, and they're tasked to find Colonel Kurtz, who had gone rogue. And the five on the boat consisted of Captain Willard, Chief, Chef, Lance or Lance, depending on which con continent you uh, you come from, and clean. Um, clean. Yeah, and well, it's all based. It's all based on a on a Joseph Conrad short story. Yeah. What's it called again? Heart Death. Of Heart, of Heart of Darkness. Heart, thank you. Yeah, well, my favorite favorite line in the movie is, "Hey, hey you." <laughs> Which was in the Dulong Bridge at part, where he says he asks the guy, he says, "You know who's in command here?" And this guy is so exasperated, he's just, "Hey, you!" <laughs> yeah, I think the the the, the one uh, line that's kind of become immortal is uh, Duvall's line: "I love the smell of napalm in the morning." Morning, and, right, of course. And you know, he made that up spontaneously. Oh, he did? Francis really? Told, yeah, Francis told me that that was not in the script. And uh, <laughs> what he, and the, what he, 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 they had to take it a couple of times because Duvall would break up. And Francis said, no, 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 you got, you got to say the, and just keep it. Just, that's a great line. Just say it again, but don't, don't laugh after you say it. Right. I read that oh, yeah. Marlon Brando did a lot of improv. Yeah, it was at this time of Brando's career when he was basically yeah. just, uh, what do I want to say, um, phoning it in. Uh, right. <laughs> That's a, you know, I went to his island. I went to, to Tataroa. Ooh. No kidding. Yeah, yeah, I spent a day at, on Brando's island. 
Nice. Yeah. Were you inv- very strange? Were you invited mm-hmm. officially, or did you sneak <laughs> sneak up on him? Well, no, 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 no. It was it was a purely commercial situation. We were we were my wife and I were staying um, in one of the outlying islands. Oh. And uh, they said, well, you know, for I think it was one hundred and twenty dollars or something, uh, we can take you over to Tataroa for the day. Oh. You can have lunch in Tataroa, and then we'll fly you back. So we did that. Marlon wasn't there. Nobody was there. Oh. A lot of birds were there. <laughs> I walked into this field, and I thought there were little stones in this field. And then the whole field erupted. It was it was birds stacked right next to one another over probably a hundred yards. Wow. There were thousands of birds just flew up into the air. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I would go completely crazy living on that island. Yeah. I mean, it was probably an hour and a half plane flight from, from Papiete. Wow. Crazy, really, really remote. Interesting. I did the music for four films for a, a woman whose name is Jackie Kong. And her mother lived with Marlon for a long time. Oh. She had a child by him, and uh, and uh, anyhow, she has a lot of stories to tell. But yeah, I'm sure. Very strange. Really blow your mind. Powerful personality. Speaking of the movie, I want to play the cue that uh, Don has lent us uh, of the of cue number 10, Clean's death. Remember that Clean is one of the crew members on the boat. So, yeah. and uh, it's his death, obviously. So here's the audio clip. I'll play it right now. might not be able to hear it unless you're monitoring it on a monitoring the live stream. But you might hear a bit coming through my microphone. Don for letting us play that one. Um, there's a question from the audience, and maybe Pat can answer this one because it looks like uh, Randy Hansen actually appeared on that clue, uh, queue of yours, uh, the Dolang Bridge. And the uh, question from Mike Flavin, our viewer, is Did either Don or Pat work directly with the guitarist Randy Hansen on his segment? Pat, 
I know you did play on that cue, so. Yeah, um, Randy, to my knowledge, I think played independently of the rest of them. Did, did, did you do anything with him, Don? Sorry, I didn't, I'm kind of not quite getting that. Oh, um, she, she was asking if, if uh, you did any work with Randy Weston, who played on the Henson. the album. He's uh, on the movie. He was a guitar oh, player. Oh no, the guitar player. Yeah. yeah. No, I never did work with. Yeah, him. yeah I think he worked completely independent of everybody else. That was another was thing good, about. Though. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, what um, what the guys from Grateful Dead did was good too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just it was completely, you know, I mean. Very strange way to make a film is to have three independent scores. Four, right. counting the one that was rejected. So, there were yeah. four scores right. all together. Hmm? There were four. Pardon? No, not together. Not, but not in any way together. Yeah, that was the, that was the problem. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, Francis did not want each of us to be cooperating with the others. I mean, even though um, I was in the same studio uh, with uh, uh, Mickey Hart, uh, yeah. we never worked together. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> and it was almost like a competition. Wow. I, I think Francis kind of liked that. You know, again, what, what Bruce Conner said, you know, he likes to set up all these building blocks and then sort of knock them down again. I mean, I did a cue, the, the, the mo quote, most important cue, Francis told me. He said, you know, this is the most important cue in the film. So it's really got to be right. Um, it's, it's the opening cue. It opens the film. Do you remember what opened the film? <laughs> yeah, the doors. The doors. <laughs> so I worked for two weeks on this. And he sent a woman up from Los Angeles who was a, a SAG um, member screamer. She did screams. Mm. And so <laughs> she was, and what, what Carmine had done was he had written a, a 12 tone row. Uh, for those of you who are not musicians, basically, can I play it now? Okay, so this is, this is 12 tones. Uh, we can't hear it. Hmm? We can't. Hear. Can you hear it? No. Oh, you can't hear it. Oh, it's, oh, uh, it's, uh, is there a way we can hear it? Never. Yeah, yeah it's okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, uh, there's there's 12 separate tones in an octave. And, and the way music is organized is that it repeats octave after octave. So a 12 tone row is a row of 12 notes in a unique order, all 12 notes that make up the scale. It was a very fa fashionable kind of music making uh, in Germany in the 30s and 40s. And then uh, when the Schoenberg and the other folks came over to this country, it had a, a vogue actually in film music for quite a while. I even have a, a, a book on my shelf about how to write 12 tone music in a film. But anyway, so, so um, Carmine had arranged this, this music as a 12-tone roll. Francis looked at it, he said, so there's just these notes? I said, yeah. I said, it's a 12-tone roll. He said, huh, OK. So he handed it to me. So then I explained to him what each note was to represent a different voice. The helicopters were F sharp, you know, so forth and so on. So, so the screamer, I can't remember what her key or keys were, but she, she, she came up from LA and had a limo take her to the studio. She came in and screamed for an hour and went back to LA. <laughs> so, so, I, so I worked on this for, for two weeks because, because it was a very hard cue to make sound good. You know, it's, I mean, 12 tones, come on. So Francis listened to it. And he didn't say anything. I knew, okay, that's the last time I'm ever going to hear that cue. <laughs> and that was it. It did not appear in the film. It was like your cue, Don. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but a 12 tone piece by Schoenberg. Well, he wrote several, but um, yeah. Clever Stuck. Yeah. 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 Number one. Mm -hmm. Clever Stuck. Yeah. You know, do you know who, you know, Lenny, you remember Lenny Pickett? Lenny Pickett? Do you remember Lenny Pickett from Tower of Power? Oh, no. <clears throat> but anyway, he is, he's, he's been the musical director for Saturday Night Live. Immensely talented musician. Oh, my goodness. So he's an old friend. And in fact, he was a kid when I first knew him. And um, he sent me an album last year that he'd done. And he called me up and he said, uh, what did you think about such and such a piece? It was something very funky and kind of orchestrally funky. Uh -huh. I, I said, yeah, I really liked it. He said, he laughed. He said, it's a 12 tone piece of music. <laughs> <laughs> He'd figured out a way to write an actually rhythmically interesting and apparently melodic version of a 12 tone piece. Yeah, you should be able to write a melodic 12 tone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but most people, well, I guess I can't play. I, I, I still remember a few 12 tone patterns from my brief uh, love, I, will, I won't say love affair, like affair with 12 tone. You know, it's interesting but, yeah. you bring that up because uh, <clears throat> I have a similar experience with time signatures. Most people feel that an even time signature is the most natural, you know, four over four, uh -huh. two over four, anything that's divisible by two. But for me, Five over four or five over eight is more natural. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, right. Strangely enough, what do you think of that? I, I agree. I mean, I, I, I don't even. I write all my music now in one four. Around what? Oh. I said, I, when I write music out now, I write it in one four. Oh, everything, one is, four. everything is the, the downbeat. Everything is one, run, one, one, one. Everything is one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I picked that up from Bitches Brew. Sorry? I, and, and Bitches Brew, if you listen oh. to you know, the, great, the great Miles Davis album of the early 70s, mm -hmm. if you listen to Bitches Brew, you'll see that the guys are, each one is playing a different sense of the one, mm. which is what gives it that amazing, like to listen to a tune like Pharaoh's Dance. Mm. Mm. You know, that, and from that, I thought, okay, why, why am I giving a special kind of acknowledgement to one piece out of four, or one, one, one out of five, or one out of whatever the time signature is? Mm. If they're all important. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's a naive way of thinking about the music, I believe. Hmm. Yeah, when, when I joined the Mothers, one of the first oh. songs I, I had to learn was this, it's called, uh, I forget what it's called. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> it's understandable, Don, it's been 60 years, so. The bass line was like this. That's in 11, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the melody was this. That's yeah. in 12. And so we played those two together. I can't do it by myself. I cannot do it. <laughs> right. There was a but, passion for that. A lot of Herbie's stuff was in 11. We had one piece in 15, it was one Yeah, but 11. 11 and 12 together at the same time? Yeah, that's a little esoteric. But, it, but it, it, of course it would work. Yeah. yeah. He was a bit, um, what do I want to say about him? Well, you had to know that the bass player and the drummer could not read music. They didn't know anything about 11, 12. They didn't know anything about any of that. But they played it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. interesting. 
I've I've also always had a little penchant for triplets, you know, three to two kind of thing, like the odd, odd, odd group to the even group. I guess if York meant mm -hmm. that, it, you could create an eleven to twelve. I suppose mm -hmm. if you're not a, if if you're not reading and you're hearing like the bass player probably would be. Do you think that might be easier to get into an eleven against twelve <laughs> than if you're reading it? <laughs> not yeah, easy. It might be. Not easy. Yeah. yeah. Especially, uh, well, the people. Here's the thing: it never came out. Mm -hmm. Most times when you play, you know, a number of fives, it comes right. out if you're playing in four four. Right. Both land on one. That's what that yeah. Means. Mm. But, but, well, uh, Zappa was a little bit. Um, I've only had. You know him, and I don't. I, I only had two instances of ever crossing paths with him, and he seemed like a guy who. I mean, he was extremely sure of himself, and he was not very tolerant of difference, in my opinion. Well, um, it depends on what you're talking about, and it also depends on what band you're talking about. You know, mm -hmm. the, uh, from the time I joined the band in 1966 until I left, which was 1974. And even after that's that, a long, that's a long time to spend with a band. Well, he changed each band. He was a different person. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm, that's interesting. But what that meant was <clears throat> like he became more, he became more like in charge, more in charge. Uh, no, no, well, that too, but uh, he was always in charge. I mean, that was his nature. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but he uh, he became more uh, dictatorial, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the first band, we were all part equal partners. Mm -hmm. The second band, we were not equal partners, but we were all a camaraderie, you know. Mm -hmm. In the third band, it was Zappa and the band, you know. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. And he was like. Uh, Totally in uh, telling everyone. I mean, there's still a lot of fun involved, but uh, not as much. Yeah. 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 The first band was so free and so open and, and, and everything. And, you know, uh, he, he wrote a piece for the Kronos. Sorry? He, he wrote a piece for the Kronos Quartet. Frank. Oh, he did? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. yeah, well, I think they actually did record it. Um, <laughs> What? This was at a time when I was married to the cellist, yeah. and so we had our studios. We had a house with two studios, and she had her actually the quartet's rehearsal studio was one studio, and, and my electronic studio was the other. And one morning, I'm I'm working on something in my studio, and I hear Joan. God fucking damn it, Jesus! And, and I, you know. I, and Joan was not a person that swore a lot. I, no. go over, I opened the door. I said, Joan, what's going on? She said, just, just, just look at this. She, was, she pointed to the music. Joan could read flypaper. Wow. Yeah, yeah. She, she was incredible. And so she said, look at this. So it was a score that had been delivered to her in... Uh, in a printout from his Synclavier. The the oh, page. really? The, the Synclavier, well, no, it wasn't just that. It was, it was the Synclavier at that time, strangely, couldn't do triplets. And the piece that they were working on was in 12. Is this, uh, I just so, looked it up and it could be none of the above. Is that the name of the piece? The collaborative, yeah. none of the above? Uh huh. So, so they fixed that. They fixed that. No. So, so I, yeah, yeah, eventually. But 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 Joan. So what what he what Zappa did was he just printed it out and, and broke the time down into sixty four notes. <laughs> so there's are sixty four. Yeah. So Joan is reading sixty fourth notes to uh, closely approximate twelve a. 
yeah, yeah, as, yeah. as you were so furious that he did you know he, you know he didn't i mean he could have taken it to a copyist or anything but he just printed it out and sent it to the quartet that's ridiculous yeah, yeah it is well, i mean when you look at the black page he has, he has a group of five a group of six and then a group of uh four mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all under a triplet <laughs> Oh, is that so? Yeah, that's like a half a bar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and try that. Try to read that without the ability to read triplets. <laughs> well, it's written no, in sixty-four no, no, no. though. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Wow. So, viewers out there, if you have any questions, please put them in the live chat. That's my request. Uh, I've got a few questions for Don and Pat this time, uh, unrelated to the movie, because we've moved. We've moved outside the realm of the movie business now um and since you brought up uh don your time with frank zappa and his various bands um you know it's well documented and you're well known for or at least the line that you played on uh waka jawaka is, is quite you know it has been uh praised in uh, on many uh, in many circles, I guess I should say. But in your opinion, is there some other track or album or project that you are more proud of or just as proud of? Yeah, it's the one I'm working on right now. There you go. I like that. It's called <laughs> it's called Reflections, and it's it begins with five etudes I wrote in March. Ooh. What piano etudes? What instruments did you? I'll send, you, I'll send it to you, Pat. Oh good. oh, good. Do that. Do that. I'll send you one of mine. Uh, that's that's what I'm most excited about at the moment. Uh, wh why is it that you're most excited about it? Is it that it's fresh and new, or the processes that you used, which you uh, are uh, kind of like delighted about, because they're new? Well, Basically, the five etudes were our uh, five etudes that essentially wrote themselves, mm. and uh, it's just one of those things that just poured out of me, and uh, and it was like, uh, oh my God, I, you know, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't even account for it because it's way beyond my ability, if you will, uh, and but it. It just I did it anyhow. So and I'm very happy with that. And uh, actually, Ian Underwood is in the process of uh, kind of mastering the whole thing. Oh, oh. tell him hi. <laughs> okay. So uh, it's Ian. it's practically finished then. When will yeah, it? Yeah, it's almost done. Yeah, when I've got the artwork. Done. Oh, when do you expect to release it? I would imagine uh, in about two weeks. That's Good. fast. Will this be in physical yeah. form or a download? Uh, it, it'll be in uh, CD form. Fair it'll be available uh, if you go to my Facebook or something like that. And it, it will be known as the Five Etudes? No, it's called Reflections. Reflections. See, I've got yeah. shot to memory loss. <laughs> <laughs> reflections okay we'll have to look uh, look for it um couple more little uh walk uh strolls down memory lane i suppose because you did send me a couple of photos that i could use don and one is um of uh, you and your work with meredith monk i believe you were more than friends at one stage uh and uh, strangely enough, in 2003, I actually interviewed uh, Meredith for her performance in Singapore. Uh, the article I wrote of her was for the Singapore Arts Magazine. This was 2003, 18 years ago. Gulp. So I'm just displaying a picture, the one that you sent me, of you playing a violin. Looks like a violin. And uh, Meredith and her ensemble uh, on a level above you. The picture of the album. Uh, the picture that you sent me. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. I missed that one. I was looking at the 
photo. Could I have a look again? Oh, thank you. Oh, got it. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's a nice piece of work. <laughs> Thanks, Don. So I don't know if you heard me talk about Meredith Monk and your work with her. Uh, I don't know if you heard me talk about your work with Meredith Monk. At least I displayed the photograph that you sent me. Okay. Did you want to? Um, I met Meredith uh, in 1967, I think, uh, when the band went to New York, and we were playing at Derrick Theater. Maybe that was 68. Anyhow, I saw an ad for Meredith uh, doing a dance piece. It was her first dance piece in New York. And so I went to it and uh, introduced myself after the, the piece, two pieces she did. And, uh, and then... Uh, we became pretty close, and uh, I did a tour with her across upstate New York. And uh, then later on, I was back in L.A., and she wrote me and said want, she wanted me to come to New York so I could be in this piece called, uh, what was the name of that? Well, it doesn't matter now. But uh, so I, I was in this piece, which took place at the Guggenheim Museum, in which the photo that you have ah, is from. Ah, of course, yes. And uh, there were uh, there were like about twenty young girls, like somewhere between fourteen and maybe I should say twelve and uh, sixteen. And then there were a few other adults and three other people beside her doing this dance piece. And so I. Uh, constructed a an electronic violin oh i mean it was just a prop so to speak it, it was a violin with the face removed and, and a lot of electronic junk stuck inside of it so it looked like you, know, you could play it or something uh but i did uh perform in that uh, i had a lot of electronic stuff don't ask me what now i have no idea um but mostly odds and ends, you know, how that can go. And, uh, you just get a bunch of stuff that creates sound and, and ways of manipulating it. Uh, and so uh, that was great. Uh, the, the, the piece was in three sections, the first in the Guggenheim, the next in a theater that was in uh, kind of the mid-New uh, York City. And then the last piece was in a loft, and, and all there were was like the costumes, a TV set with kind of pictures of the, the piece before, and, and you know, various odds and ends that were in the piece, uh, and, but no people. Oh. So that was, it was kind of like a telescope where you're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But that was Meredith. She's like one of the greatest creative persons I've ever met in my life. And yeah, I did uh, interview her for one of her concerts that she did in Singapore 18 years ago. I was writing for the arts magazine, and she brought her, t her, her mu uh, music and movement type show to Singapore. So uh, I did meet her then. I'm not sure what, where she is now. I guess she's still in New York somewhere. Haven't stayed in touch. I don't know. Yeah, she had this really great piece at uh, Disney Hall where they had this giant, uh, I don't know what to call it. It was like, it was like a round. <laughs> it was like this big round room. In the middle of the, and it moved, it went up and down and all kinds of weird things. And it, you could, there were like a whole bunch of people could be inside of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyhow, that was just the premise of that. Uh, and the piece itself was like maybe 30 years old. And these people spent three years learning that piece. Wow. 
because it was so complicated and so uh, amazing, you know, yeah. it was just incredible stuff. I went and saw that. I actually went to a dress rehearsal because that was the only way she'd get me, get me and my wife in. <laughs> so speaking of new electronics, um, I understand that you made your own synthesizer. Uh, <laughs> am I right? Or am I barking up the well, wrong tree? Uh, actually, it was right. Uh, this was like in 1960s, in between 66 and 67. That was a fact. And Moog yeah. uh, had yet to release the, the big modular Moog. And uh, I just got a bunch of oscillators, you know, maybe oh. 60 or 50 oscillators, mm. put them all in the box. I had a, an Echoplex, <clears throat> an Echoplex. That was in mounted in the box, and uh, a theremin was on the top of the box, <laughs> and uh, I think I had a, a, a testing oscillator, you know, which is quite large, oh. uh, and that was in the box too, and uh, so I hooked it all together, and, and uh, I think I had some kind of filters that uh, I could also use to manipulate the sound. So that was yeah, it was like a throw it together kind of synthesizer but i understand that you actually used it for an album that you released thereafter i've got a picture of the album cover somewhere it's called uh, uh filters oh, oscillators yeah, I, and envelopes so. i did I, I had this album called filters oscillators and envelopes and and uh i i took a lot of recordings from you know the 60s and i'm not sure if i had that, that not maybe i did i i think i might have had that so yeah that was in there and uh basically uh you know the stuff i had on stage like uh, i think i had a fender Rhodes and some kind of weird farfisa organ although it wasn't one of farfisa so yeah, that's that's what I did. So but that was fun. We have a Meredith performed. Sorry, go too. on. I say Meredith performed at this theater with me also. Oh. I, have, I have another recording of her uh, singing while and and I was doing all this electronic stuff and wow. stuff. So I have a question from the the audience. I believe it's from Don because I'm not familiar with your album, but it looks like it could be. Uh, John Tobacco. <laughs> he says, I love Eye of Agamotto and Sweet 15. What was the inspiration oh. for those pieces? Well, the Sweet 15 I, was a collaboration with Emil Richards. I don't know if Pat, did you ever know Emil at all? Oh yeah, I, 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 I've hired Emil. Oh, you did? Oh yeah. Yeah, he yeah, died. I mean, he, was, he, he was the number one guy. <laughs> he always was, yeah. Yeah, for, for, for that kind a, of profession. He was an amazing person. Uh, anyhow, he and I wrote that song together, which of course was in 15. And, uh, uh, and uh, oh. I can't play it anymore, but that was kind of like I don't know if you could hear that or not. Yes. Yep, yeah, hear it. Very well. <laughs> okay. How about the eye of Agamotto? What was your inspiration for that? Um uh, it's weird. Uh I yeah. I'll give you a little story that my drummer, he said uh, to his daughter, not too long ago, about two years ago, he said, uh, hey, uh, do you know what the Eye of Agamotto is? And she said, oh, sure. It's the amulet around Dr. Strange's neck, <laughs> which is true. Dr. Strange, I mean, have you seen the, the latest movie of yes. him? Uh, and he says, well, look it up on the internet. So she typed in the Eye of Agamotto, and it said, composition by Don Preston. <laughs> so she was kind of blown away by that. 
uh, I wrote that, I don't know when, uh, probably uh, late 50s, early 60s, early 60s. And uh, I'll give you two bars of that if I can. Thank you. Guys, I got to go in 10 minutes. Okay. So. Oh, okay. Well, never mind that. Then. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Don. It's not important. I do have a similar question for Pat. Uh, your work with Herbie Hancock's pretty well documented, especially your work on yeah. Crossings, the album. Um, it seems that he took the tracks Quasar and Water tor Torture to your studio, uh, hoping to learn how to play the Moog, but in, in the end he got you to lay down some tracks instead. Um, I played on all the tracks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all, 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 I, I, everything that was done on synthesizer while I was with Herbie was done by me. Okay. Do, do you have a particular favorite one, or they were all just as special to well, you? Well, uh, um, I, I, there was there was there were two albums that I played on when I was in the band. There was another one that I played afterward, but those two albums I both loved. Uh, crossings and sextant. Mm -hmm. uh, crossings is a is is really it's it's African classical music, mm -hmm. and as a result, <laughs> we never made a lot of money. You know the the the, the music was pretty advanced. Mm -hmm. It was lo lovely for musicians. If you get a chance to listen to Crossings, it's amazing music. Mm -hmm. and then Herbie went a little more commercial with sextant. And one of the tunes on that called Rain Dance has been pr probably uh, <laughs> for about 10 years, every rap group sampled from that album. Oh, that wow. particular piece. Yeah. Um, and I like I like Rain Dance. That's a lovely piece of music as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am curious as to what compelled you to do cover versions of the themes from Star, uh, Star Wars, wasn't it? You did a, an album oh, that of was, that cover was, tunes. That was my, re I, listen, that was my record company. Your, your record you know, company? They, they, yeah, I was on Mercury oh, okay. at the time, which was um, a division of, um, uh, what, what is the big European, anyway. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the head of the, the president of Mercury said, well, you know, we, we got to get something that's really commercial. So he suggested that I do Star Wars. And I, I didn't really love the album, but I'll tell you a funny story. Sure. I'm in a record store in Berkeley one day. Berkeley at the time probably still is Telegraph Avenue is so hip it can't stand itself. <laughs> You know, so, so I walk into this record store. And there's some bored guy, you know, in his mid 20s. He's got really long hair and, you know, whatever else establishes him as a member of, uh, you know, the fashionable underground. And um, so I'm going through this used record stack and I run into my album, Star Wars. I hold this up. He points at it. I said, what? He says, try it. <laughs> I said, well, actually, it's mine. That's my album. <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah. I said, yeah. Have you heard anything else of mine? He said, yeah. That was the only album I ever liked. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. So, so I put, put the album back down and left the store. <laughs> so we have a question from the viewer for Pat before we release both of you. Uh, the question is from Gary Elton. Pat, I've loved you since the oh, hi, range. Hi, Gary. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you know each other. So he said, I've loved your synth arrangement since it's released in the 70s. What gear did you use for that and how long did it take? What, what uh, the four the, seasons? The planets. Oh, the planets. Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't know. It took probably three months. You know, I mean, about what you would expect. My decision when I when I did the album, and I have mixed feelings about it, was that I would actually perform the entire score. Oh. So if Holst wrote it, I played it. Uh, which is a little bit different than what Wendy did. I, I, in retrospect, by the way, as I think I told you the other day, I feel that like, you know, several of us have done 
versions of classical music. Mm. Tamita, notably, and and Wendy, mm. uh, and and me, and other people too. But I suppose ours are the best known versions. I think Wendy was the only one, that, the one that interests me musically today. Mm. You know, I think I took it too seriously. I think Tamita didn't take it seriously enough, and Wendy, who was you know an outsider, was. Being an outsider frees you to go in your own direction, which she did. Yeah, we got to be friends over that, that period of time. I loved her. She was great. And the mu her music sense is just wonderful. So thanks. We have a last question for Don uh, before we release the two gentlemen. So that's pretty apt. We had one last question for app, uh, Pat <laughs> and now one for Don. Don, your question is from John T Tobacco, or is it Tabaco? Uh, please correct me if uh, I'm wrong. Uh, he says, were some of the solos you played on Frank Zappa's Grand Wazoo and Big Swiftly, uh, Swifty? Uh, Big Swifty One, I think that's what he wrote. Uh, take improvisations in their entirety or edited by Frank? Was there any punching in? Is that clear? I didn't quite get the question. It, it was too, too long for my brain. Okay, uh, I'll rephrase it. So he's curious about Grand Wazoo and Big Swifty One. Are those two separate pieces? I don't know what that second thing is. So let's look at Grand Wazoo. Uh, this person wanted to know if your improvisations were done in their entirety. You know, you start and you finish in the one recording, or did you punch in at all? No, there was no punching no in. Punching in yeah? No punching in, yeah? You just went no with the stream of consciousness and you finished it. And uh, one, one day, Bob Moog came to Paul Beaver's studio. He, Paul, Paul was the, another one of the West Coast representatives for the Moog. And uh, anyhow, they were talking. Paul said, I, you got to hear this uh, album. And he played the Grand Wazoo and my solo on that Grand Wazoo. And Bob said, that's impossible. It can't be done on a mini mode. <laughs> so little, little did they know that I built a pedal with a, a battery in it that, which provided voltage to that would manipulate the filter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, now they sell them, you know, like yeah, that. Sure. But, uh, at that time, there wasn't no such thing. And so that's why Bob said it couldn't be done because I was doing it with my foot and my hands. Yeah, yeah exactly. So thanks, anyway. Don. So thank you guys. Um, there, there's so many more questions, but if you, the two of you are willing to return for round two some other time, maybe a few months down the road to tackle some sure. of these others, they're about production and synthesis techniques and stuff, we'll have you back again. How's that? That was great. Thank that was you. Great. Thank everyone, please. Job you get to do it together with no money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we never get paid uh, yeah. anymore. No one pays us anymore. <laughs> so uh, please thank Don and Pat for their valuable time. Uh, we want to wish you, uh, 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 you know, uh, a prosperous New Year again, as I said. And uh, please stay safe if you're traveling. Stay safe and may you have an abundance of wonderful adventures. Hopefully most of them pay you. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more shot to get. Oh, yes. Uh, me too. Me too. Good job. Well, stay well, please, Pat, Don. Thank you so much again. Good to see you again, Pat. Yes. And, good, good to see you, Don. Uh, stay yeah. in touch, and I'll catch up with you soon. Take care. Thank you so much, Shelley. Take care. Yeah, bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> So there you are, everybody. Oof. What a trip. Yes, I learned that word in America, and I really felt like that was a trip, all right? Either that or some kind of a journey. 
my mind is still, my head is still spinning and my mind is not on this universe, not on this world, not on this mortal coil right now. <laughs> it's teletransporting somewhere else. <laughs> Let me take a deep breath. <laughs> we have totally and utterly enjoyed them both on this live stream, haven't we? Um, I want to thank also the various sources from which I gain much understanding of the music behind Apocalypse Now. Uh, thank, you know, thank you guys for making uh, the effort to archive some of these important things that took place in... We had Pat and Don to shine the light on some of the, the crevices, the in-betweens where no one knew about them till today. <laughs> so you guys, um, you also know that I have my own music um, and I have uh, released my EDM set called the Triangle EDM set uh, for download on Bandcamp. Uh, the QR code, you can scan it to buy my Stella set, which I put together thanks to the Lunar New Year. And I thought Stella and Lunar and a fantastic year ahead, so Stella. <laughs> uh, you can get all four of my albums, poster, and a track from the EDM set as well. Um, and please subscribe if you haven't already. My goal, I know, dreams, my goal is to attain a thousand subscribers by the end of this year. It's a tall order, but I believe it can happen. So uh, you guys, please subscribe and please encourage your friends to subscribe. Please encourage your friends to come join me on my next broadcast. Um, and it will be Darren Docterman, a VFX supervisor amongst other roles he's played. The last time we spoke to Darren, he mentioned his work on Star Trek Picard, The Passengers, and Star Trek The Motion Picture Director's Cut, which is a Robert Weiss project. You guys know Robert Weiss. He worked on uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still. He also worked on West Side Story and The Sound of Music. And of course, uh, the aforementioned Star Trek, the motion picture. So Darren will join us next Saturday. I have such wonderful and intelligent and gifted and talented friends. I am so humbled. You guys as well, so talented. <laughs> I really enjoy having you guys with me. You have been wonderful viewers. And thanks to those who have just volunteered uh, subscribing to my channel, even buying my CDs. Yay! I want to say thank you to Gary, Mike Flavin, John Tabaco or Tobacco. <laughs> I guess it's Tavaco. Uh, Dark Yu Allen. I think that's what you said the pronunciation was. Lou Allen. Doug. Andre. Thanks, Andre, for your help in getting Don and Pat uh, on the live stream. I can't seem to trigger your comment. Ah, here we are. Kevin P. Um, who else has been here? Gary Elton. And the rest of you. <laughs> Again, it's been great having you guys. Please come back to join me uh, next Saturday uh, and welcome Darren Docterman to talk about more CG and VFX stuff on films he's worked on. And Darren is a sci fi guy, so am I. So, and I could wager a bet that you guys are sci fi guys, gals as well. So anyway, I look forward to seeing you next Saturday. You guys take care. Okay, bring your friends along, please, and get them to subscribe. Thank you. Alrighty, I shall say goodbye uh, to another happy live stream. Miss you guys already, and happy Chinese New Year. Uh, 
I should say in Chinese, uh, 新年快乐 which is、uh, Happy New Year. 恭喜发财 is、uh, prosperity to you, and I'll add superb health as well. May you never fall ill at all. <laughs> okay, I will see you next Saturday. Take care, y'all. Bye.